Hello, I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman from the Greensboro, North Carolina Fire Department History Book Committee. We're here today at the Greensboro Historical Museum. I'm standing in front of the General Green, the first steam pumper, or as they called it back then, a steamer. Today, December 9th, 2019, we are starting a new tradition of recording and preserving the heritage and culture of our retirees. Our retirees have contributed so much to the success of our great fire department. Their stories retire with them and are sometimes gone forever when they pass away. They will share their emergency calls that will always be a part of their memories forever. So sit back and listen as they carry us through their journey in the Greensboro Fire Department. J.W. Manus. I was on 40 years and eight months from 1957 to 98. I retired as a battalion chief. Well, I grew up in the Mill Village and uh, quite accidentally got to the fire department through a friend. I no, I didn't know a thing about the fire department except Station 3 it was on uh, Yanceville Street. Now, I think it was a different name of that street back then. I knew where that fire station was because I would go by it and go into the old movie theater over in the on State Street, but that's all I knew about it. I never did go in there. I never did talk to any of those guys. That they was. I was working in the hosiery mill down on South Elm Street. Ladies' hosiery. I think they used my legs for models. <laughs> and uh, then through a friend of my wife, we met an, a guy who was on the fire department, Al Vaughn. So he said, why don't you go up and fire, prior, apply for the fire department? And I didn't even know where you went to. I didn't know where the fire station was up there. So I did, and surprisingly enough, they called me. I knew I wasn't afraid of height because I climbed trees, and so ladders wouldn't be a problem. And the training process was, I don't think it was as much as four weeks. It might have been three some of the people in my class I can remember is uh, W.C. Allen, and uh, the class before me had the, one of our famous chiefs, Frank Jones. He started a year before I did. My first station was at the old Central Station on Green Street. Yeah, they had inside, the outside was old brick. Inside was a, a clay-colored light, uh, like a yellowish brick and when they started tearing that building out to build a restaurant they had the bricks piled down on the corner down there and so I got enough that I used in my house when I built 30 years ago I, I built a house out in Brown Summit and I used that brick in the uh, back in the fireplace thing the first truck, fire truck I was assigned to was a tank truck they had just annexed property in the county where they didn't have hydrants. So they needed a tank truck, and I think they had two. And one of them was at the central station, and I was assigned to that. I didn't have a captain on that truck, but there was a guy there. Was, his name was Jim Fennison. He was in, he'd been there a few years before I, were, before I came on, and it was like, he was like a captain. He was... My next assignment, I was moved to Station 7, which had just been built. It was new. And so I was, they moved the tank truck out there, and I still was on the tank truck, but I was at an outside station. And when we first moved there, we played ball in the middle of Wend <laughs> Wendover Avenue. If you can imagine that. Play. Wendover Avenue went as far as uh, English Street, so... There wasn't a lot of traffic on it, and all the neighborhood kids and the rest of us played ball out there in the middle of the window. Yeah, I had a nickname. I never did know why. There was a guy, I uh, can't think of his name right now. Uh, I liked him all right, but he, he came on when they didn't have a, a, a requirement 
an educational requirement. So I think he graduated from the third grade down in Sampson County somewhere. And you know, in the grammar grades, everybody has to have a nickname. So he started calling me Slider, and who, where that came from, nobody knows. One of my most famous pranks was having the uh, trick and treaters ride the lightning. I took an old lawnmower engine and stripped down the engine, threw away the piston and everything. I only kept the part that charged the spark plug. And I mounted it on a board where I could uh, tap my foot with a, and spin the, uh, the little crank thing and it would charge the plug. At Halloween, the kids came by and I said, before, before you get your candy, you have to ride the lightning. And they said, what is that? I said, well, I'll show you. So I took them in the locking ro locker room and I had a half a circle where they held hands all the way around the locker room. There's about 12 of them. And the one guy on the one end, he would hold the spark plug wire. I had the ground wire run to the kid on the other end, so I charged the whole line when I spun on that thing, they all rode the lightning and they was bouncing off the lockers. You know? <laughs> and then when they left, a few minutes they came back with another couple of kids. They want to ride the lightning. The union activity began later and I never did take part in it. I had uh, grew up in the mill, mill village where there was a lot of problem with unions and, and the union trying to organize the mill village. and. Uh, a lot of bad things out there, so I had a I had a bad attitude toward the union. When I was a captain at Station Three, my mother and father lived near the fire station, and uh, so I took the guys out there to lunch one day with the truck. We still in our territory, so somebody called the station and there was nobody there. So when I got back. Uh, Barbie gave me a call. Chief Barbie, he said, I, I don't know what rules you're in violation of, but I'll check and let you know. Well, I never heard anything from him because there's nothing in the rule book about going to lunch. But every time I see the guys out now going to lunch or going to get groceries and they got the truck, I say, you're welcome. I took all the blows for that one. <laughs> Living in the fire station with a group of people was like having another family. You know, most of them you got along with like they were family, and of course in every family there's some one or two that you don't like, so. But it was really great. I loved every minute of it. Of course, one of my favorite, my favorite friends was W.C. Allen, and uh, we were on different shifts most of the time. But my wife was involved with the deaf community and around Greensboro and so I learned sign language and I taught some of the guys there and once I had a call that involved a deaf person and I, and of course this, this lady had a problem with overheated dry or something and she just thought every fireman could sign you know but I was, <laughs> I was the only one in the fire department that knew sign language. The first call that stands out in my mind is uh we had a call with that tank truck to the graveyard down on McConnell Road. And I had a guy riding with me, Bob Gulledge was his name. And he w walked out in the graveyard, it had been raining, he walked out there, stomped his feet a little bit and said, come on out. So that day I got the tank truck stuck up in the graveyard. In the 9-11 call, I, I just knew how many Firemen, fighters died there, and that was that was really impressive, you know, to think that many. 343 firefighters died in that fire, and uh, I've got a sticker on the side of my truck. It says 343. I've, I've worn worn that ever since, and I always will. There was one guy that was real impressive along the lines of, of knowing what to do, what has to be done, and everything done just right. But 
he wasn't all that great a personality other than away from the fire station. So Mick Newnham was his name. I think he had I think he had a he had relatives with the city or something, but he was a great guy, but he was just you do it his way, you know. I remember one thing that really was really bad. Uh, we had a guy, can't think of his name right now, but he he got off the, they was answering the call. He got off of the truck and they were parking near a hydrant. <clears throat> and I guess he thought they were going to catch that hydrant. He got off with the, uh, He got off with the hose, and they they started backing up the truck for some reason and killed him. His name was Jesse Gray. Correct. No, I wasn't on but it. It was at my were... station, and he was a good friend, and it was it was hurtful. Yeah. My, one of my proudest moments was graduating from the fire science department at GTCC. I thought that was a big deal. And I guess it was, I think it helped me a lot. I can't think of anything I'd do differently if I did it again today. We've always attended church and, and that's a great part of our lives. Well, I can tell you about my wife, we've been married 64 years. And if it looks like it's gonna work out, I'll let you know later. My health has been really good. I haven't had any problems at all. I will tell you one thing about my wife. She was president of the Ladies Auxiliary, oh. which uh, was a, like a canteen truck that would result, uh, respond to really long fires. The Ladies Auxiliary back in those days had a, de a designated truck that I they think they bought for themselves. They bought themselves and they would go out on larger fires and provide uh, refreshment and a place to rest and catch your breath and like that. And she was president of that group. I remember <clears throat> when the first uh, integration of the fire department occurred and they started hiring the black guys. And we had one on each shift and it turned out to be one of my best friends. And it was, his name was Ray K. Flowers. He went on to be, to be great. And I remember when they f hired the first ladies. And they were, they had their separate bedroom and showers and stuff. And so it wasn't all that difficult to deal with. Well, one thing, my off-duty life involved was with deaf people. My wife was into that. She was working at the school for the deaf and teaching deaf in Sunday school classes and church classes. And I learned that in self-defense. I had to <laughs> be able to communicate a little bit with them. It's a great job and you will develop friends that will last the rest of your life. We hope you enjoyed watching these documentaries. It was our goal to share and preserve the memories of our retired Greensboro firefighters. It is our desire that these documentaries will inspire future generations to continue the brotherhood, sisterhood, and camaraderie while always striving for excellence in their careers. While fire apparatus, equipment, and technology have improved, several things will always remain the same. The courage and bravery it takes to mitigate natural and man-made disasters will always be a part of the job. Although our retirees are no longer a physical part of the GFD world, a giant piece of each retiree's memories have been shared with you today. These memories will be in their hearts and minds forever. A special thank you goes out to Captain Harold Haney for his many long hours of recording and editing. Thank you, Harold. A job well done. Mm -hmm.